there was a 17 year old young man in Washington who was looking on some satellite imagery and saw that they were building logging roads. And he reached out and made sure that people who might come to action would be here. You've successfully politically persuaded John Horgan, especially during an election, to not, I mean, even send in the RCMP to pull you guys out. It's not so much the, the, the big corporations that they affect, they affect families. Families like mine. I have three kids, beautiful wife, and all I'm doing is trying to make a living. There's boatloads of, of people who, who have a, a notion or an idea that what they're doing is right by stopping good, hardworking people from going to work in a great industry. Eco-radical blockades are becoming more and more frequent across Canada. Go to work. What? You may have noticed. You, you guys are in my way. You may have even lost your job to these radicals, these interlopers who you might find on a railroad track or blockading an oil and gas worksite, a pipeline, or a forestry worksite. One thing these radicals all share in common is that they use the mainstream media or perhaps work in consort with them and radical leftist outlets into duping, hoodwinking government officials in BC or the federal government across Canada into thinking that these radicals share the majority opinion with the general population, that's obviously not the case and Rebel News needed to look into this. So we did. We embedded ourselves in an eco-radical blockade on the west side of Vancouver Island to dig deep and to find out what was going on at these blockades. What were their tactics? What were their plans? And what was their message? How are the people? That's, we have a voice and it's our right to use it. Climate action! Do you think that they grasp the carnage that they create? I don't think they care. Climate action! We want it now! Well, they say logging's bad. And yet, the things they do to prepare the ground for, for new trees, is exactly what logging is done. Cutting permits are being held up because you've got, you know, environmental groups being funded out of Toronto or the David Suzuki Foundation. Extremists like David Suzuki have worked hand in hand with foreign funded lobby groups to brand the Canadian forestry industry as something that it is not. To lie and to change the facts, to fit their narrative, to change government policy and destroy jobs, lives, and families. That's what we're up against, and that is what Rebel News came here to expose. As we delve into this story to understand why extremists like David Suzuki are targeting the forestry industry, it's important that we talk about the facts. You can't change facts, and if you're armed with them, it disarms the radicals. That's why David Suzuki doesn't want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. Canada has the most rigorous environmental standards in the world. And we also have one of the largest forests in the world, making up 9% of all forests globally. 348 million hectares, in fact, of Canadian soil is forested. Only 0.02% of forested land in Canada has ever been replaced with something else, has ever been deforested. Canadian forests are not at risk, period. Now this data isn't from some forestry lobby. This is actually from the government of Canada, one of the most left-wing governments in the entire world. Now deforestation is a problem, globally that is, but in Canada, not so much. In fact, the forestry industry in Canada helps promote the growth of new forests, helps replace and replenish and avoid wildfires. Forests replacing itself, which is something that it naturally wants to do, but is unable to in most cases because of the radical green lobby from the early 2000s telling everyone to not cut down a single tree, to not prepare for wildfires. Now with that, we are now on Vancouver Island and we are on our way across the southern coast of the island to make our way west. We landed in Victoria, just at the airport here. We have to keep going, I think, all the way up to Port Renfrew. We're, we're going off directions that the hippies laid for us, actually. They, they gave directions to everyone who wanted to come join their blockade, so we're following those. And I think it's right about here, and then we have to go all the way up here to underneath where this is actually not you know, covered by the map. 
My guess is they have no idea how much old growth forest is actually protected in BC. That's what their whole point is, is that this is somehow the last remaining old growth forest of something rather, and their point isn't very clear, but they have no idea what they're talking about. My cameraman and I drove across the vast forests of Vancouver Island, down isolated highways across bridges and rivers and up service roads into areas where there was no cell reception at all, all to find a blockade that was advertising itself online as a blockade fighting against the company Teal Jones. Now, Teal Jones is a forestry operation based out of Burnaby and they were logging or at least trying to log this area near Ferry Creek. After driving for hours, after turning the final corner down a service road, following a map used by these blockaders posted online so that others could find them, we did exactly that. Hi there, how are you guys? After explaining to them my journalistic relationship with Greta Thunberg, they welcomed me in as one of their own. Now, to be fair to them, they were quite nice, although they were only nice, I presume, because they thought I was a leftist, I was going to be there as a stenographer, like the CBC would, or perhaps one of the leftist alternative outlets like Vice News, so that I could repeat their story and broadcast it to a larger audience. Now that's not why I was there. I was there to get the other side of the story. So the old growth protection is what the goal is for all of us, is to okay. have, because we have less than like 3% of high productivity old growth remaining in BC. So these are endangered ecosystems. It's not just about the forest, like the trees. We don't want to just see the forest for the trees. We see the forest for all the life forms that yeah. depend on it. Mm -hmm. And trees like the high productivity old growth coastal Douglas fir, it's not a specific logging company that we have issues with. We have issues with the politic. When you look at the legislation around, like when a company has a cut block or a TFL that they have to leave, there's a, there's a, clause where you have to leave i think it's t i think it's 10 percent of old growth yep. in that area well that's kind of a loophole because there's high productivity and low productivity old growth and high productivity are our massive carbon filters so they're responsible for 25 percent of our atmospheric carbon filtration in the world mm -hmm. in a time of climate crises to me it seems disastrous to take these natural filters that keep our water clean you know mm -hmm. that keep our air clean that create habitat these are these are all of our issues that yeah. way. Coming from Alberta, where there's a conservative government, it's weird. it's strange to come to BC, where there's an NDP government, which you know someone calls socialist. Why are they not on your side? Well, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that NDP is not on our side. They walk a fine line, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, they like to verbally express their care for our environment. They've just come out with their report on old growth conservation and they've deferred the logging of certain old growth forests, which mm -hmm. I think is very, very small. When we have, when we have such a small percentage left, it should be encompassing all, uh, but what is a deferral? And mm -hmm. you know, that deferral is putting it off until later. Mm -hmm. It's not creating a protection. It's creating a temporary, Pacification. To say I was confused at this point would be an understatement. When armed with the facts, it's clear that the crisis that these eco-radicals were trying to sell me was simply a fabrication. They wished that there was a crisis, but there was none to be had. Only a formerly thriving industry that has now since lost thousands of jobs. I was curious what could compel eco-radicals like this nine or ten of them to bring their children out past any form of civilization. No cell reception, no running water, no plumbing, for weeks on end to blockade this one forestry operation. And also, what happens downstream of this blockade? What happens to the jobs, the men and women who are no longer able to put food on their table for their children? For that side of the story, we have to fast forward. I had the opportunity to join a tugboat operation on the Fraser River an operation that employed Randy Price, an indigenous man from Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands you might know them as. Now Randy, a father and a husband, an indigenous man, works in this industry and depends on it to put food on the table of his children. It's not, it's not so much the, the, the big corporations that they affect, they affect families, families like mine. I have three kids, beautiful wife, and all I'm doing is trying to make a living. And it's hard enough with the COVID right now than to have to deal with 
eco radicals. You know, like it's just, it's not fair to the working man. And do you, how do you feel when they use the indigenous name? Basically, one one indigenous person gave them the right to protest in the name of all indigenous yeah. people, and it was all well, white people. I, I'll tell you what, it doesn't. Uh, I, I don't really um, uh, go for that. Like, they don't speak for me. I I I. I speak I have to answer to my kids, to my wife. I, that's what, my main goal is to take care of them. So uh, for me, um, their job is to create havoc. My job is to look after my kids and family and to look after my parents and my, my husband, my wife's parents and so on and the family, you know, and it's a big responsibility. So, so for them to come into my home and tell me what I could do, how I can make a living, I don't agree with it. And I think it's very uh, unfair. Unfair for uh, a big corporate, however they get paid, I know they get paid, however they do, is not fair for me at all. And I'm just an average working guy. I pay my taxes, you know, I do, I do the, the right things for the country. I'm, I'm doing what the government asked me of and what my family asked of me. And what they're doing is, uh, I think, is a crime. But no, no, nothing gets done. It's so frustrating for the average guy just to try and make a living for his family. You know, it's very frustrating. Do you think that they grasp the carnage that they create? I don't think they care, you know. Um, if you really delve into into it, you know, uh, they say logging's bad. And yet, the things they do to prepare the ground for, for new trees is exactly what logging has done. You know, there's no real science behind it because I we see in BC, you look, look around us, right? This is jobs, this is families. This isn't, uh, de this isn't destruction, you know? It's building. It's building. It's building strong families and it's building BC. Now back to the blockade for a moment to wrap up that side of the story. I had to challenge the blockaders on some of their facts. I, I was reading a report on uh, the BC website as I was coming in and they, they say, and this is from the NDP government saying old growth forests aren't going anywhere and there's actually 3 million hectares of it that is permanently protected. No, it's not. It's, or they've just released, um, in that document that they just released, it was that 350,000 hectares were going to be protected. Now, hold up a moment. If that number she just cited me there is true, if 350,000 hectares or 3,500 square kilometers, about half the size of the greater Toronto area, is all the old growth forest that's protected, well, maybe there is a crisis. Unfortunately for her in the crisis they were trying to sell me, that's just not true, and my number was actually an underestimate. So I, I have this fact sheet from the British Columbian government. It is a socialist government, the most left-wing government in Canada, I think it's safe to say, uh, even farther left than Justin Trudeau. And John Horgan says that old growth forests are not disappearing. There are more than 25 million hectares and about 4.5 million hectares of that are fully protected, meaning no touching it whatsoever. But this is also one of the last intact watersheds, yeah. um, as far as I'm aware. And which is also strange that you could, I, I, I'm very confused that they can come into watersheds and take that risk for us all, for an economic gain for a small pocket of people. Would you like to come and see what we call the grandmother tree? Wow, <laughs> that is that is the biggest tree I've ever seen in my life. I thought this was sort of an indigenous protest. Actually, I heard just the story the other day how this came about. There was a 17-year-old young man in Washington who was looking on some satellite imagery and saw that they were building logging roads into one of our last intact watersheds. And he could tell that this area was so important that he reached out and made sure that people who might come to action would be here. And he really like started the action. 
So that being said, um, we do often have an elder here from the Pachadet Nation, Bill Jones, and he's welcomed us to be here in his territory and this land's always been very important for him. Mm -hmm. um, this is where he grew up and he doesn't want to see this gone, but a lot, of, a lot of bands have had a lot of strain and they make choices that they feel they have to do to create value for their family too. And if we've used industry to push people and push people, like mm -hmm. you have to be open-minded to how people come to these decisions of what happens. Perhaps the most interesting thing I learned that day was that this blockade was conceived by an American interfering in the Canadian industry. It's a common trend in the oil and gas industry, in coastal fisheries, and in the logging industry. Americans saying, no, 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 Canadians, you can't be doing business because we're in the same business. You've successfully politically persuaded John Horgan, especially during an election, to not, I mean, even send in the RCMP to pull you guys out. It, it, I mean, it is illegal at the end of the day. It is legal at the end of the day. It is a legal right to peacefully protest. Now, naturally, I had to go see the other side of the story. We spoke to the antis. Now, how about the pros? Travis from O'Brien and Furst Logging invited me on to his tugboat operation on the Fraser River to see how this industry works, the good that it does for its employees and the people of Canada. You know, and then at the end of the day, for a guy to go home and, you know, expect to carry on you know, paying for his house and his car, put his kids through school, you know, the stress that are on individuals is, is fantastic. People are leaving the islands. People because, are leaving. Because of, the, because of how dangerous it is or because of the business is disappearing? Because there's no work. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be attributed to the eco-radicals, both the ones blockading. 100%. And also the ones politically. Yeah. So provincial, provincial politics, um, upper level government to government politics and then right down to where you know there's boatloads literally boatloads of of people who who have a, a notion or an idea that what they're doing is right by stopping you know good hard-working people from going to work in a, in a great industry you know a well-managed you know well thought out industry and they're, they're being put out of work i i honestly can't think of you know, myself personally, any other business um, that has so many restraints, constraints, and um, you know, uh, a regime of management in order to you know, just get up in the morning and start the thing and, and go to work. It's, it's incredible. The forestry industry is fighting fires on all fronts, no pun intended. It's not just the government interfering and refusing to award contracts, it's the government not sending in the police to intervene when eco-radicals casually break the law. There's a public perception that the forestry industry is evil and vile and it's a dirty industry, when in fact it's people like Travis and his colleagues hauling logs day and night that replenish the toilet paper on your shelves at your local grocery store at the onset of this pandemic. It was people like Travis that saved the day. That's why his next story was all the more horrifying to me. So they showed up there for work. They were, the blockaders were there and the eco-radicals and they said, you're not logging here anymore. You're destroying the forest. You're gone, you gotta go. <clears throat> so they had policy, you know, and, and written up and and the managers there, they, they said, okay, everybody, you know, just get back in the trucks and get back in the crew boats and we'll all go home. We'll come deal with this later. So they left amicably. And then um, there was, I don't know how the discussion went when they got back home, but it was decided that they would go back the next day and get some of their personal effects and talk to the blockaders and just say, you know, these are some of the things that need to be maintained or looked after. There was fuel systems there that had to be shut down. There was, you know, paperwork and all, all kinds of stuff like this. And uh, they were met with, um, they were met from what I've heard with uh, with fierce resistance. So uh, one of my friends told me that uh, one of the managers had, you know, pulled up in a company pickup truck and rolled down the window to try to address them in a, in a very nice way. He said he was very calm and peaceful about it. And uh, the first thing that happened was 
one of the protesters pulled the uh, covering off of a rifle and brandished the rifle as they walked towards him, holstered the rifle over or slung the rifle over her shoulder and then brandished a knife and a can of pepper spray at them. And who was that? It was Ann Spice. Now this was horrifying to hear. Not just because moms and dads, employees of a Canadian company on Canadian soil were being threatened with death upon appearing at their work site. Just imagine if a teacher was threatened with a shotgun every time she appeared on the school grounds in the morning. No, it wasn't just that. I had heard this name before, Anne Spice, in a story that I covered months and months ago in Northern British Columbia. Anne Spice was actually one of the coordinators of a blockade that had nothing to do with this forestry industry. It seems like she is a professional blockader using violence to get her way. Like what is going on in society today that accepts that kind of behavior as being something that's, that's, um, that they'll forgive them for it. There's no forgiveness for doing something like that at all. Now threatening people with guns is a far cry from what was going on at the blockade I appeared at, but themes remained. Not of violence, but of a cross country network of radicals fighting against local industry. My cameraman, who's from Toronto, noticed something from this blockade that I would have totally missed. The pylons that these eco-radicals were using were not from a local pylon shop. They were actually from the city of Toronto. Someone came from Toronto with these pylons with the intent of stopping industry. There's a cross country, maybe even global effort to stop not just the forestry industry, but the oil and gas industry, and every other industry that seems to benefit indigenous people and lift them out of poverty and push them into prosperity. It's been 30 years of, of uh, constant badgering and bombarding of this idea that what the forest industry is on the BC coast is absolutely opposite of the truth. Absolute opposite. The, the evidence is there, and the reason why the evidence is there, after logging for a hundred plus years on the BC coast, is the trees grew back. The forests grew back. They're different. Yeah, of course they're different. You know, they're not old growth forests, you know, with dead decaying trees falling everywhere and great big glorious looking, you know, eye candy trees. You know, it's, it's different, but they grew back. There is a crisis brewing in the Canadian forestry industry, and you probably didn't even know it. Just as Canada's oil and gas industry faces eco-extremists, eco-terrorists, and eco-radicals, so does our forestry industry. After documenting and joining eco-blockades on Vancouver Island and boarding a forestry tugboat operation on the Fraser River, we've gone deeper than ever before into unmasking and exposing the people on the front lines of the war on Canadian industry. We did the job that we expected of the mainstream media, but recently they've been dropping the ball. We've had this opportunity to do this work because of your support. If you go to bcblockade.com, you can see the full story and help us keep on going.